for joining us. I'm Nancy Furness, and this is We've Got Issues. We're filming on site at the Coquitlam City Centre Library, and I'd like to thank the library for giving us this space to carry out the interviews. I'd also like to acknowledge that the interviews are taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands of Coquitlam First Nation. So we thank the Coquitlam people who continue to care for the lands and the waters and all that lies above and below. Joining us today is Mike Farnworth, who is the NDP candidate for Port Coquitlam. Thanks so much for joining us today, Mike. My pleasure. Now, you are such a familiar face, both in the legislature as well as in Port Coquitlam. For those that are maybe new to Port Coquitlam or new to politics, can you um, give us a little bit of your background, your connection to Port Coquitlam, and why you're running for the NDP? Okay. Well, um, I've lived in Port Coquitlam most of my life, uh, over, I'll well, actually, we moved there in 1969. Um, mm. And so I grew up there, uh, went to school there, um, and it's always, you know, considered my home. Um, I got interested in politics sort of accidentally. Uh, I, uh, there was a, a previous government back in the early 80s was closing down Riverview and they shut down was known then as Colony Farm, right. and it had one of the largest dairy herds in the country, uh, one of the best dairy herds. Uh, it had cattle, it had uh, it had pigs, it had uh, a lot of agriculture, and there was a lot of talk about developing it, and the Coquitlam River um, flowed through it, and it was a place that I'd always, with my brothers and friends, we'd gone fishing and exploring down there, and to me, that was absolutely just a terrible thing. Well, it's a beautiful space. It is a beautiful space, and so I ran for city council um, on, on my platform, and I still have my original flyer that I used mm -hmm. that was to protect um, uh, calling uh, to, to protect calling farm uh, from development and that's what got me into politics and subsequently uh, I got elected and then I spent seven years on the city council and then our, our MLA Mark Rose retired and he'd asked me to consider running and so I ran provincially and that's how mm -hmm. I, I, I got into politics um, and the NDP aligned very closely with my values um, we're, you know, a working class, um, middle class community. Mm -hmm. um, we've got wonderful, you know, outdoors, Burke Mountain, which I was very strongly wanted to see as a provincial park. And uh, that's kind of how I ended up in politics. Wow. So there's lots of history and lots of environmental mm -hmm. um, history behind mm -hmm. there. Now, as MLA for Port Coquitlam, you've held many other positions as well, um, including the Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General and the um, Government House Leader since 2017. And then in 2021, you were appointed as the Deputy Premier of British Columbia. So I know that's a lot of different files and, that you hold, but can you just give us kind of a brief summary of what some of your responsibilities are? Well, when I was Government House Leader, um, one of those responsibilities was for the uh, the running of the legislature itself, so the introduction mm. of bills, uh, the question period. Mm. Um, I would often, I'd have to direct and manage question period, who's going to answer which particular question mm. comes That up. could be tough. That can be very yeah. challenging at times, um, particularly if it's a difficult, controversial subject. Uh, so, and then we also on, sit on what's called a Legislative Assembly Management Committee, which is tasked mm. with the running of the legislature itself. Um, as so there's a lot of administrative duties. There's a lot of administrative duties, duties that go with okay. that role. As uh, Solicitor General, Public Safety Minister, I'm responsible for um, uh, police in our province, correction facilities. I also have responsibility for the uh, legalization of cannabis, right. um, alcohol, um, amongst other, oh, and also uh, responsible for uh, ICBC, the Insurance Corporation. So there's a whole range of... of, of mm. uh, it's a lot of territory to it's cover. Lot, it's a lot of it's a lot of territory. Yeah. It's a very interesting ministry. And then as deputy premier, um, it's the the premier is away. For example, then I would be the the minister that chairs cabinet, um, as well as if there's something that he's not able to attend, then I quite often would be asked to right. uh, to, to to fill in for him. So I guess he can't be two places at once, right? That's right. That's okay. right. He's, so that's a high he's, level of trust that uh, goes along with that position, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And. You know, whether it's been, uh, you know, Premier Horgan or Premier Eby, I've always had a very good relationship 
um, with with both of them. In fact, it's you know with colleagues from both sides of the aisle in the legislature. Right, and that's important in the role that you're playing. You have to be able to build those relationships and maintain them. And that's something that the public often doesn't see mm -hmm. or realize. Is that they'll often see you know question period. They'll see the right. adversarial part of the legislature. We see each other. Exactly. Everybody. Yeah. Exactly. But what they don't see is the work that goes on apart from that. And a lot of that is built on, you know, having a relationship, being able to talk to, to people, being able to, you know, and have a discussion and not have to worry about someone saying, oh, they said this or they said that. Right. It's being able to say, hey, look, here's a problem. Um, how are we going to do the day's business? What do you need? What? And, 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 mm -hmm. and it's that a bit back and forth. And there's a lot of that takes place because a lot of the work gets done in committees, parliamentary committees, and that's members from all parties are involved in oh, that okay. on the basis of you know how many seats they have in the in the in the legislature, um, and in a number of cases those parties have to come to unanimous recommendations. For example, so if they're hiring an officer of the legislature, let's say a conflict of interest commission, mm -hmm. um, or the children and families commission, it has to be unanimous recommendation. Ah, and I think a lot of people aren't aware of that that sort of collaboration that takes place behind the scenes. And, exactly, yeah. and, and that's why having an understanding of the institution. And MLAs who understand the role of of the institution is is in my view is very important. Mm -hmm. And also, I think it kind of brings to light to me the importance of not only voting for your party but considering the individual as well, because you want to hopefully get somebody in there that is able to work and build those relationships. Absolutely, I mean that's yeah. that, that's really important. You know, when you have a group of people who come along who have no history with 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 the, with either politics or the legislature, and you are giving them power and authority to do things, it's, hang on a sec, you, people, there's a lot of work where it, 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 cooperation, collaboration, and you need to be able to do that. Right. Now, you have so much experience. Um, I'm going to ask you a few tough sure. questions. Okay. Um, one of the ones is related to public safety. Mm -hmm. So recently, we've heard a Port Coquitlam City Councilor speak mm -hmm. out and say that um, people are afraid in Port Coquitlam to go downtown. He said it's due to the presence of what he's calling people who don't want to work. Mm -hmm. So possibly people exposed um, experiencing homelessness and, and you know mental health and, and drug related issues. Um, but the police reports show something very different. The RCMP reports show that crime is actually trending downward. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that? Tell me what, what are the tr uh, crime trends? Where are they going? And also what you're doing to keep people safe? Yeah, no, and I, I, I'm really pleased uh, to get that question because if you just watch the evening news, it's mm -hmm. very easy to have a crime story on every night. I mean, right. it's 365 days a right. year. The reality is, is crime has been tending down. Um, okay. Violent crime, um, you know, uh, uh, the terrible random stranger attacks that we saw in mm -hmm. Vancouver are down over 50% over what they were oh, over, really? over a year ago. Um, that's not to say that things don't happen, and, and we are very concerned when, we do, when they do, but there's a lot of initiatives and a lot of investments have taken place in policing, mm -hmm. um, working with police, working with communities, uh, both on the enforcement side and on the, the causes side right. uh, to make sure that we're doing everything we can keeping our community safe. So, for example, um, we had 256 RCMP vacancies in the province. Those are provincial vacancies. Mm -hmm. And we did the largest investment in the province in filling them up. Um, and it's a three-year program, and we're now halfway through and we're at well, well ahead of schedule. So that's providing RCMP officers to communities under 5,000, rural parts of the province, uh, specialized teams mm. such as the Major Crime Unit, um, the Child Exploitation Unit, and Highway Patrol. Um, we've introduced additional legislation. So, for example, unexplained wealth orders to go after organized criminals um, who, in the course of a police investigation, they may go, hang on, we're seeing some suspicious uh, right. wealth here and money laundering. And, and so you have people working on people that. People working oh, on that. And they're right. able to go to the courts, mm. get an application. The individual that has to explain, where did they get this wealth? Where did you get this wealth? If oh. you acquired it legally, fine. If not, then we're able to confiscate it. Um, you've recently seen we've taken down three Hells Angels clubhouses mm -hmm. um, in Nanaimo, East Vancouver, and Kelowna. Again, based on organized crime uh, at the, the fighting. We've so that's on the enforcement side, and there's a right. lot more on that. On the social side of things, we know that police are often called to mental health 
yes. uh, situations. Yes. And they're not mental health workers. And they're yes. the first ones to tell you that. They have a very difficult job. But they're on job. the front line. They're on the front line yeah. and they have a very difficult job. We've introduced some programs, the CAR program. Um, we've got one here in Coquitlam. They're in other parts of the province. Very successful where you have um, a, a, a police and you have a mental health worker. Um, going to a scene and being able to deal with not having to ha necessarily have to have a police officer deal with the situation. Right. We have uh, put in place what are called peer assisted care teams. Again, this is uh, mental health professionals, uh, people with lived mental health experience, going to a situation, being able to do an assessment and determining whether or not a police officer is needed. Mm -hmm. and, it, it, and it was piloted first in New Westminster and in North Vancouver, and very successful. And now we're starting to roll that out into other parts of the province. So there's a lot of work being done uh, in those areas to ensure that we're we're keeping our we're keeping our streets and our communities our communities safe. Right. So it's not just about handing out parking or speeding tickets and things like that. It sounds like there's some really serious work being done here yeah. um, all across BC. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, one, one important one, because I know gang violence is often a concern to people, mm -hmm. but we put in place a, um, uh, a witness security program right. uh, designed specifically for BC because the federal one isn't really suited to our needs. And the result of that is people have been able to get individuals into that who've been able to, that program who've been able to then provide um, information, mm -hmm. evidence that's resulted in police being able to solve. I think at the last count, over 70 um, murders that they would not have been able to wow. do otherwise, resulting in convictions of people and those individuals going to, to jail. Right. Gang violence now in the province is at its lowest level in over a decade. So, you know, so that's something to be proud of. Absolutely. And that's a really tough one to get on top of. Too. Absolutely. And but, you know, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Right. We work with other provinces. Um, we have um, led the, the charge along with Ontario for bail reform uh, again. Uh, and what is bail so reform? Bail, what so, are those? So reforms? someone who used a firearm in, in committing a crime, for example, right. that could be a reason to deny bail. But what we've seen is, is people using knives, clubs, uh, in the case of so weapons. weapons, weapons in general, yeah. and being able to take that uh, as a reason to say, you know what, you are a danger to the public and so bail can be denied. Right. And um, BC and Ontario led the charge of that, the federal, provincial, territorial tables where we meet on a regular basis uh, to make these kinds of changes. And, uh, um, you know, it's another example of, of I think, when governments uh, can take an issue that impacts not just here, but other mm. parts of the country and get together and, and push for change. Wow, I feel like I learned a whole lot there and I think that we probably could have talked all yes. day about that yeah. one subject. Yeah. So a lot of really good work going on there, some that people may not be aware of too. Yeah. So thank you for sharing yeah. that. Okay. Um, so I want to carry on and talk a little bit more about um, perhaps the public safety aspect. Um, the BC Conservatives have, have said that they um, are in support of involuntary treatment or mandatory mm -hmm. treatment. And the BC NDP has said that, yes, now they are also mm -hmm. um, in favor of that. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about providing care for folks that have long-term concurrent um, mental health, possibly drug and, and brain injury issues, and putting them into secure facilities for treatment. And there, it seems to me, and I'm hoping you can clarify this, that there's two types. There's um, insti uh, some that will be in correctional institutions mm -hmm. and some that will be somewhere else in the province. Can you yep. tell so, us about that? So we, we know in terms of dealing with the, 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 the mental health uh, uh, challenges, and in particular when coupled with uh, addiction mm. issues, which we have seen dramatically increase over yes. the last, particularly since COVID and the opioid, the opioid crisis, is there needs to be a range of um, solutions um, to be able to deal with it from individuals who are, hey, I've got an addiction problem and I need help. Right. We need to make sure we've got the, the beds. And the, the voluntary. Spaces. Exactly. Yes. The beds and the spaces for them. Then there are people for whom, you know, they have severe addiction and severe mental health issues. Yeah. And there are um, the Redfish Healing Center right. is, a, a, is an example of the kind of treatment facility that's open for them. It's, it's uh, voluntary, but there is security. Um, there, but it there's is accountability. There's it's accountability. voluntary and it's accountability yes. exactly. as well. Exactly. Okay. And and that 
is working very well and we want to see that model being uh, replicated in other parts of the, the province as well. Okay. And there's been a lot of interest from a number of, of, of communities in that. Um, then there's the issue of, and this is the one where I think the public has the greatest concern, and that is individuals who have uh, severe mental health issues, mm -hmm. severe addiction issues, mm -hmm. and significant brain damage. And brain damage may be due to overdose? It could be due or to, in many cases it is. Okay. In many cases it is due to overdose, uh, and often repeated overdoses. Oh. And so these are individuals who are a danger to themselves, and um, the public. Mm -hmm. And so it's we earlier this year, uh, the Premier commissioned Dr. Vigo to come back to right. report uh, an expert in, in, this, in the, this area. And how can we deal with those? And so that's where the involuntary care. Right. Um, uh, uh, and it's not a large number of people, um, but it is a, a very problematic Okay. Uh, group. Because we have that capacity already under the Mental Health Act, correct? We have, we have some of that capacity. Okay. Uh, so what this will do, this will, uh, this will then, uh, the first two facilities, one will be in uh, sort of pre-trial center. Right. The other will be out at uh, Alouette. Um, right. uh, and there's two buildings there that are being, that are literally almost ready to go. Uh, right. And they are, they are separated from the correctional facility. Okay. Um, and then the, uh, then other uh, facilities will be built, um, because many hospitals already have floors um, or units um, that can like be Like Royal Columbian? Uh, Royal Columbian has some. It's in New St. Paul's. But like the hospital right. up in Terrace, uh, will have, and and there there will be a facility where you'll be able to to these individuals will be able to receive the uh, the, the treatment that they need, um, and in a in a secure in a secure way with the professional staff as well. Okay, I'm just curious. Like um, you have some in correctional facilities and yeah. then some in hospitals. Yeah. What is the difference? Are the ones in correctional facilities related to? Like it, criminal it, activity, it, or it, 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 it's it's facilities that are uh, that are available that are available now. They're available okay. now. In some cases, it may be because of okay, you know, um, the, the individual is there because of, of, of criminal activity. But they're not. They are. They, they will be viewed as separate from the from the. Okay, so they're not being all put together in that's right. and being re-traumatized. That's right. You're, okay. not, you're not in the right. you're not in the in the, in the facility with the prisoners. Okay. Um, thanks for clarifying that because I wasn't really clear what the difference was there. So, um, okay, so we have lots to talk about here. We're going to move on and talk about car insurance. Everybody loves to talk about car insurance. Um, ICBC, the Insurance Corporation of BC, you are in charge of that. That's one of your many files. Can you tell us about some of the changes that have been made under your leadership and whether those changes have accomplished what you set out to accomplish? So in 2017, one of the things that we learned upon becoming government was the, the, the dire financial strait that mm. the ICBC was in. Right. That uh, the, uh, the previous government, uh, which Mr. Rustad was part of, had literally plundered the reserves of that corporation. So put it in, uh, taken put it into that out and put it into general revenue. At the okay. same time then, I mean, the excuse was to let's just, we could, the ICBC then had to jack up oh. insurance rates. In many ways, it was an indirect form of taxation was right. what was taking place. Um, the, we brought in changes. Uh, we changed ICBC uh, from a litigation um, model where you know you're suing and lawyers are involved to a enhanced care or no fault as it's commonly referred to but an enhanced so when care in model. So lawyers are involved a lot of that money goes to paying lawyers? Yes, so we, were paying, we were paying over one and a half billion dollars a year in legal fees. Um, you know, okay. uh, <laughs> like it's a huge amount of right, money. Right, right. And so by taking that out, mm -hmm. um, except in the case of you know criminal negligence for right, example, okay. right? Um, our model is, is, is basically the same as what they now have in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, where they've had for decades and it's worked, whether it's been an NDP government or a Conservative government or whatever, they, they've kept that model because it works. And it's done, it's done two significant things for people. Okay. One, it ensures that they get care for as long as they need it. Uh, and so, for example, if you're in a catastrophic injury, the money you would have received under the legal system uh, would have been, um, you know, the average settlement was in line with what the individual had who was 
you know, who caused the accident. Oh, and I guess it also of their insurance, right? So yeah. if you had two to three million, that's what the settlement was. Oh, okay. and and that was then had to last you for the rest of your life. But that's it. but that would then have the legal fees taken out, which are often a third, right? So oh. so you're you know you're getting reduced. So now you get coverage for as long as you are, as long as you need it. And if that means you know it ends up costing ten million, twelve, then that's what it is. Um, the, at the same time, if someone was injured under the old system, if someone was injured catastrophically, for example, in an accident that was their fault, the most they'd get, I think, was about three hundred and thirty thousand dollars. That was it. And that again, doesn't go very far it nowadays. Does not, does not go very far. Mm. And now that's again, you are, you're. It's about getting better. It's, right. That's what the foundation of, of the changes is. And looking at other models that work yeah. and learning. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And 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 uh, other provinces are now looking at that. I, I got it. Alberta is is looking at making changes. Uh, is looking oh. at going to the enhanced care model. The other thing it did was it brought down um, insurance rates. Yes. And so uh, the average uh, ICBC driver now is saving about twenty percent, about five hundred dollars a year on their insurance. And because the corporation has been back, back in the black, we have been able to give uh, back rebates, um, mm -hmm. I think totaling about $400 now, um, over, I think it's over, it's well over $900 million in terms of mm -hmm. money going back to the policyholders uh, in the form of the rebates. And so I think ICBC has made you know, a significant reorg change in, in, in its direction mm -hmm. um you know obviously there's the, you know there's the things that we will change is it's like anything you make a change right. you find okay this well, needs to be adjusted and, and that's we can do that. part of good governance exactly. is to exactly. go back and improve where exactly. you see improvements exactly. yeah. yeah okay yeah. and that's fair enough yeah Okay, well, thank you. That, that answers that question really well. Um, and I think we've all appreciated getting those rebate checks mm -hmm. as well. Um, I'm going to ask you a question that's yeah. a little bit near and dear to my heart. Right. And this is um, about the Wet'suwet'en mm -hmm. situation. So back in 2019, mm -hmm. British Columbia adopted the um, UNDRIP or the yeah. UN Declaration yeah. of rights for indigenous people. And then in 2021, we saw the arrest of a hereditary Wet'suwet'en mm -hmm. chief, mm -hmm. and he had um, gone out and confiscated and decommissioned some heavy equipment mm -hmm. that was being used to build the coastal gas link mm -hmm. pipeline. And um, he said that that was because he, the company did not receive free prior and informed consent mm -hmm. from the hereditary chiefs, and he was enacting Wet'suwet'en law. Mm -hmm. um, in 2024, he was arrested. And, mm -hmm. um, in 2024, Amnesty International then went ahead and announced that Canada has their first prisoner of conscience, and that was this Wet'suwet'en mm -hmm. hereditary chief. Can you speak to that and tell us, you know, what is the NDP government going to do to ensure that um, respectful relationships occur going forward? Should there be other um, resource projects proposed to, uh, on unceded territories? Yeah, so I'll start with UNDRIP, um, mm -hmm. and we are the first province uh, to do that, and that is has been foundational in terms of how we have been bringing... We've seen lots of changes. Yeah, lots yeah, of changes for sure. and legislation coming forward. Yeah. Um, at that time, um, the government made it clear, as did the First Nations um, who spoke at the bar, like uh, um, UBCI, uh, Union BC Indian Chiefs, um, so these are the leader, elected, the, the, the elected the first, the first chiefs. nations leadership council, right. the ones okay. who, who you see on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Grand Chief Stuart Phillip, for example. Mm -hmm. um, they have been. Um, uh, it was clear, uh, made clear at that point. UNRIP is not a veto. Right. Right. Like it, it, it is not a veto. Um, right. And that, uh, uh, and and it deals with going forward. Um, it is not retrospective. Um, and so that's where UNRIP comes in, and that has guided government's uh, actions and thinking since then. Uh, at the same time, um, in the case of coastal gas and the pipeline, there are two things. One, uh, yes, there is title, um, the unceded, I mean, the courts have said that in Section 35 right. of the Constitution. Um, but at the same time, the, the same judicial system that 
that says that's in place, right. also said that the um, Coastal Gas Link has the lawful permits and to do the work they've done, and they granted an injunction um, to ensure that that, that work right. takes place. And so the court grants the injunction, the police are required to enforce the injunction, and that's where the... So is that something that was just caught in the system before UNDRIP was adopted? I, I think I think it's a, I think it's an, you know look it's an indication of the challenges we face. In mm, this no doubt, it's in, it's in a, terms of reconciliation. Yeah, um, it's not an easy. It is not an easy thing subject at all. for sure. And that's why when you know John Rustad uh, says, "Oh, he wants to repeal UNDRIP." Yes, and then, it's a big concern. Uh, that is a big concern. Yes, um, and and then I got a couple of days later, he's like going, "Well, no, I don't," and so that you know. What, 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 what's needed in this province is certainty, mm -hmm. um, and that's what UNDRIP um, and, and the approach with UNDRIP does. Right. That's why you know, uh, particularly in northern British Columbia, where the, the resource the development, resource development yeah. um, if you go, uh, many of the mining companies have been partnering with First Nations. Mm -hmm. uh, the Taltan, in particular, I think, are a, pr a prime example of that, of uh, where they've been partnering. And working, and you know, providing jobs for First Nations communities, ensuring First Nations contractors are able to bid, um, and, and 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 recognizing that that they are in their territory, and so that certainty, um, which UNDRIP allowed, which UNDRIP is able to 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 provide, and the and, and the pathway, um, it's unfortunate, and I think potentially very very hurtful, not just to Indigenous people. But also to BC's economy uh, by saying, "Oh, we're going to tear it up. That's not going to help anything. All we're going to end up doing is where we is 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 in essence going back 40 years, and everything is constantly in the courts. Right. And right. We don't want to be nothing. tied up yes. in the courts. Yeah. So um, thanks for answering that question. Yeah. I know it's a difficult <laughs> and complex um, yeah. situation, and we really look forward to BC NDP um, carrying on with that good work of reconciliation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, what is the biggest challenge that you think faces BC today, and what are you, you doing about it? <laughs> There's a lot of challenges. I know. I mean, we're living in a very, I think, interesting time, both uh, nationally and globally. Uh, mm. There's a lot, a lot going on. But in, in terms of BC, I think it's it's a, it's, it's affordability. It is it, it's housing. Right. It is housing. It is healthcare. It's education. It's the fact that ten thousand people every thirty-seven days move to this province. Yeah. Because Perhaps it's a whole bunch of issues all and interconnected. They're, and they're all interconnected. Yeah. I mean, you know, we have one the, one of the strongest economies in the country. Um, we are one of the you know fastest growing um, mm. populations. Uh, people love to live here. Uh, so that places places pressures on our healthcare system to make sure we we've, we've got the healthcare workers we need, that we've got the hospitals that we need. Right. It places pressures on our education system to ensure that we've got the skills, uh, sorry, the schools being built that we need. You know, like Hazel Trembeth burned right. down, and I want I, I want to make sure. Well, it is going to be rebuilt, but. It's, it, it just shows the, you know, just the sheer scale of the challenges yes. that we're facing as a province and how they're all inter interconnected with each other. Yes, good luck untangling all of that. Yeah. Um, is there a particular challenge in Port Coquitlam or does it just face the same well, I, challenges? I, I, there, there are local issues to be sure. Mm. I mean, I want to see the, the Coquitlam River Bridge replaced over the Low Heat Highway. That's the old mm -hmm. bridge that I think was built uh, something like 1948. Right. Um, it, it's coming. It's past it's, it's due. Coming. Yeah, it, it, that yeah. needs to be replaced. As I said, I want to see. Um, but that's uh, municipal. It, it, it's well. Let's say the cost will require provincial assistance. Okay, uh, so we will get provincial. That's that, that, okay. That, that's my goal: is to make it easier right. for the city of Port Coquitlam uh, to replace that bridge. Okay. Um, the uh, SkyTrain is one that you know the the current SkyTrain line was built with the ability to do an extension to Port Coquitlam, so I'd like to move ah, something. Like so we a, might see... I'd like to see a business, at least a, a, a business case in place as to, okay, how would you do it, when would you do it? Because right now, obviously, the, the one that's being built is is the one in, in the Langley, Surrey right, uh, right. Uh, extension. That's the, I mean, we all need <laughs> more transit More transit. Options. Um, yeah. There's been a lot of work being done, you know, for me, the, the Maryhill Bypass and safety improvements. We've just announced $10 million mm. 
to do upgrades on there. Bodhi oh. is having the worst bus stops, I think. In, yes, in, in there's British no. Columbia. Exactly, it's terrible. Anyway, that's being done. That's being okay. Fixed. Great. Um, there's, you know, the the, the infrastructure, uh, civic infrastructure, mm -hmm. the new soccer field that uh, the province is, is was is funding for the tune of about six million dollars. So there's a lot of there's a lot of local infrastructure at the same time ensuring that we're able to tie into the provincial infrastructure um, uh, works that are that are underway right. you know, recognizing that a third of our people here in, in the tri-cities they cross the bridges and work on the other side of the Fraser River right um, you know yes. and so have they got the good transportation links that they need making sure that we don't put poles back on the bridges and mm, and that's something that's been proposed that's has it no but the, well mr. Ross the, had said that they should have never taken the, troll, mm -hmm. the tolls off the bridge so right. um, you know it's and it's it, it's working with look, the, the city of Port Coquitlam it's working with the province it's working with um, you know doing that collaboration collaboration so yeah Okay, so it sounds like there's lots left to be done there. Um, I've asked you some kind of tough questions, so now it's your chance. Can you tell us what have some of the highlights been over the last term that you um, were at MLA for Port Coquitlam or in your other roles yeah, as well? I, I, th I think there's a number of things that uh, I'm particularly uh, uh, pleased with. But well, one is being able to get that new soccer center in, uh, in, in south side of Port Coquitlam. In, in just off of uh, uh, Gates Park, um, you know, it's such a popular sport, and it's really going to help put Park Coquitlam on the map uh, in terms of being able to host tournaments. But mm -hmm. most importantly, for kids to have the opportunity to play uh, to play in, in sports, and I think that's that's crucial. Um, continuing, you know, on ensuring that we get our uh, civic infrastructure, like the bike paths are going on, mm -hmm. on Kingsway. Um, Funding uh, from the province for that has been, you know, really particularly okay. uh, gratifying to see. Um, you know, I'm always wanting to ensure that the Coquitlam River is a priority. I mean, one of the things that I'm most proud of um, during my time as MLA is getting the first stream flow agreement uh, with BC Hydro on the Coquitlam River, so that it ensured that there was enough water going over the Coquitlam River Dam in summer to maintain a proper stream uh -huh. flow. For fish and um, that's something important that, that's that's yes. really to me is, yeah. is is really is really important um you know ensure just looking at making sure that 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 we're a, a growing healthy um community mm -hmm. those are things and then obviously in my role as solicitor general and i outline some of the things whether it's the you know the witness security program whether it's unexplained wealth orders um whether it's uh, you know hiring uh, uh the, the the 256 police officers there's a whole host of things that that you know have made um, a lot of hard work. A lot of work there, <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's very it's very rewarding, and and just being able to deal with people's concerns, right? Mm -hmm. and, and when my office, my constituency office, when we're able to help people um, overcome um, problems or deal with, uh, you know, uh, when dealing with government, it's always not easy, not the easiest thing, and so being able to to, to solve problems. Uh, sometimes we're not able to, but but I think most of the time we we are able to do that. Okay, well, thank you. Okay. Um, I, just one, our time is almost up here, but I have one other burning issue that okay. I just wanted to bring yeah. up to you, and it's about our changing political landscape mm -hmm. here in BC. Mm -hmm. um, we have the Green Party, which tends yeah. to be progressive. We yeah. have the NDP, which yeah. is center left. Yeah. We had BC United, which yeah. was our center right party. Yeah. And then we have the Conservatives, which are significantly mm -hmm. further to the right. Yeah. And we saw just an, at the end of August, BC United um, collapsing their mm -hmm. campaign, yeah. election campaign, and throwing their support behind the BC Conservatives. Mm -hmm. uh, can you speak to that? What does that mean for us as voters, and what does it mean for politics? I, th I think what we've seen um, with the collapse of the BC United Party is something unprecedented in this province, indeed in this country, because I've looked to see, mm -hmm. we've never seen anything like it, where a leader has unilaterally decided, no, that they are not going to contest an election, and they were the official opposition, yes. uh, and to throw all their candidates under the bus um, Shirley Bond, an MLA of 24 years standing, yes. uh, someone very respected, of, very respected, yes. finds out by a voicemail on her, on her machine yeah. that you know that, that they're out, um, is quite frankly appalling. And what we've seen since then has been the um, no nominating meetings, 
no local democracy in choosing your, mm. your, who your candidate is going to be. But That's a good point. It's a hit to it, democracy. It, it, it is a ways. hit to democracy. Yes. And the decision was made in a, you know, in, in a backroom law office in Vancouver uh, and, and, and where they just said, well, this person is going to run here and, uh, oh, oh and, uh, our candidate, there, oh, if you want to stay there, no, if you want to continue to run for us, you're going to move to this riding. Um, uh, telling um, Dan Davies, I think up in Peace River North, uh, the United uh, Party M MLA, and the same with Mike Bernier, no, you can go run another ride. Like, that is mm -hmm. so undemocratic, so no local accountability, just... A little uh, bit unethical. Have, yes, we have never seen anything quite like this mm -hmm. in this province, and um, I think it bodes ill for democracy. What we are seeing is, it is what we're seeing coming up out of the states um, with, with the Trumpian okay. approach to politics. It's seeping across the seeping border. across the border. I mean, John Rustad, he's, um, you know, um, will hold a press conference, but no questions, or one question and no follow-up, mm. which is, you know, that's just... It reminds me of another leader not so long ago, yeah, it's, federally. It's, yes. it's, it's just uh, not how we have... Uh, how politics is traditionally done in this province or indeed in this country. I, I think it's unfortunate and I think it's a real um, uh, blow to, you know, uh, the democratic traditions that we have in our province and I think that all of us uh, should cherish. Well, something we're going to have to keep our eye on, I think. Um, thanks for your thoughts on that. Yeah. And we're just going to wrap up. Is there anything, any last thoughts you'd like to add before um, we close? No, other than this election is a crucial election. And it really is, um, uh, I think, a choice between uh, building on what we've done over the last seven years. Uh, is there a lot more to do? Absolutely. But if we're concerned about health care, if we're concerned about education, if we're concerned about housing, then we cannot um, return to what we saw under when John Rustad sat around the cabinet table, which was increased um, ICBC rates, where we saw housing prices skyrocket, where we didn't invest in our health care system, where they sold land that was earmarked for hospital. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can't, we, we can't return to that. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining thank us you. this afternoon. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. This is We've Got Issues, and we've been speaking with Mike Farnworth, who is the NDP candidate for Port Coquitlam. Yeah.